Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. E everyone can hear me at the back? R right. Um, I, I should start off by saying thank you very much for the hospitality to, to the society, uh, for the invitation, greatly appreciate it. Uh, generally, I, I don't like standing still when, when, when I lecture. I, I tend to move around, but I know what will happen. That, that, that's what I would like to prevent. So I'll probably stand on, on one side and you know, maybe go up. So if that makes you nervous, it's, it's unintentional, believe me. Uh, but, uh, years ago, there was a uh, Minister of Education in, in South Africa, uh, Minister Kader Ashman. And when he had the opportunity to address an audience, when it got closer to a meal time, he would start off by saying that his mother taught him one should never get between a man and a woman and his or her meal. And then he would promptly say, I'll be brief and give a two-hour lecture. <laughs> so, uh, Woody assured me that I have from now until the banquet. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I won't subject you to that. Uh, I'll also not be, I, I won't be this brief either. Uh, if, 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 if you've ever heard me lecture, I always finish my lectures with this slide. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it gives comfort to know that some things are predictable. So when you see this slide again, that'll be the end of the presentation. If you don't see the slide again, it means I just had to stop because I ran out of time. So I thought I'll show it now, so, so, so that you know. Um, and it's interesting. That, uh, I always thought that everyone, forever, was thinking about succulents. Because that's what I do. You know, I've got these thoughts running through my head all the time. I dream about succulents. So, uh, it, uh, to, to try and paraphrase what, what someone said, this was Shelley, Percy Shelley in 1820. Shelley was a Brit. He knew nothing about cacti, but he wrote this when he was in Italy. If you love soap operas, read his biography. He died very young. He, he was, I think he was still in his 20s. And from the ode to the west wind, he wrote, I fall upon the cacti of life, I bleed. And, and in a way, that's what we do. You know, you, with all these ideas and stories running through our heads about the plants that we love, we in essence bleed, we bleed these stories. He died in a boating accident uh, just off the coast of, of uh, Italy. Uh, or, or was it an accident? So, so, so read, his, read his biography, very, very interesting. Um, so, you know, one of the tremendous fears that I have is that I'll stand here and do a presentation and you'll be bored stiff. So, you know, I'll, I'll try and make it interesting and, and hopefully the little bits and pieces that I can tell you will, you know, will also excite you. Uh, but, but, you know, one is never sure. Uh, so, in uh, looking at it from a different point of view, uh, this is what Hazlitt wrote in 1970 on Wordsworth, when he said, These poems, and that's uh, Wordsworth, persuade you that the most insignificant objects are interesting in themselves because he, Wordsworth, is interested in them. And, and that's the challenge, that's, that, that's what we want to do, to try and convince you that these things that interest us as, as, as the uh, presenters here, they must also interest you. So this is how we teach geography in South Africa. Uh, there's you know, the, the top of the world. Uh, the, sorry. Uh, the, the 2010 Soccer World Cup was held there. Uh, and I think in 2006 the World Cup was held in that small little country there at the bottom of Germany. Uh, there is Southern Africa. That's, that's the primary focus of, of the presentation, yes. inevitably. Um, and and we'll, you know, we, we have a, a system of dividing the world up into these floristic regions. And, and for the southern African flora, it's in essence Namibia, Botswana, Swaziland, Zimba, uh, Lesotho and South Africa. And the rest, in essence, doesn't fall into this sort of really uh, arbitrarily decided regions. 
in, into which the world was divided many, many years ago. Uh, so when later in this, this uh, meeting, when we talk about the succulents, uh, obviously we'll also cover a little bit beyond that, but in, in essence that, that same region. Uh, a very brief, I, I, I won't spend too much time on, on, on how the, uh, the vegetation types, the different biomes are represented in the country, uh, but very, very briefly, uh, that little purple part there, and there are little outcrops to the side, that's called the Feinbos biome, Feinbos. Feinbos, it, it, it translates directly as fine leaf bush. Uh, and it's very similar to chaparral, to the matcha in Europe, uh, all these Mediterranean-style climates. And in, uh, in, in that part there, one will find very close to 10,000 species. So in this entire region, this, this five-country region, uh, there are about as many species as in the entire continental Northern America more than twice the number of species that you will find in continental Europe. So it's immensely rich, where you will have in one square meter, meter by meter, for example, six Erica species, the heaths, completely different species growing side by side within one square meter. Some resprout, some regenerate by seed, where when you come to northern Europe, you find one and that's uh, uh, Kaluna vulgaris. In South Africa there are 860 heath species. So it's enormously rich. Uh, of course, the, it's not just the Feinbos that's very, very uh, wealthy in, in terms of species diversity. Uh, the, the densest concentration of aloes in the world uh, is right there. It's around the Leidenberg area, the border between Pumalanga province and, and Limpopo province in South Africa, uh, with, with a tremendous number of species in the bushveld. You know, that, that, that typical picture that you conjure up when you think of African savanna. It's a grass layer and a tree layer, a park-like uh, vegetation type. That's, at present, the, the densest concentration of aloes known in the world. In this five-country region, the FSA flora, the flora region, about 165, 170 species of aloe. Um, and the closest to that, of course, is the Madagascan aloe flora, which must be roughly about 150 now. Uh, another very rich part, of course, would be these thickets, uh, those dark spots there. And you can see they, in essence, follow the river valleys. Those are all uh, the rivers that drain to the east, the eastern, the, the, the Indian Ocean side. And most of those rivers are infested with Balazia. Uh, the rivers that flow to the west are not. Uh, but the moment that they move into the subtropics, those rivers ideally is not, not really for swimming. Uh, uh, Port Elizabeth, that's where the 1820 settlers landed uh, just, just under 200 years ago, impenetrable thickets, uh, and, and it was they were dropped there to create a barrier between the Cape of Good Hope and the rest of the continent. It, of course it didn't work. Uh, so, but we'll get to the history lecture uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, with the next presentation. Uh, and then uh, the, what we would perhaps want to call real deserts would be the Namib that runs into southern Angola there, into Namibia, very well known. Uh, the Nama Karoo, the typical Karoo flora, which looks very similar to the, the, the buttes that you have around Arizona. Of course, the floristic composition very different. So the vegetation looks very similar. Remember, vegetation is something that has a structure. There's a tree layer, there's a grass layer, uh, but the, the flora, the actual components, uh, differ vastly. But uh, let's move on. So to, to try and summarize, uh, it's by far the richest temperate flora in the world. Uh, about 21,000 native species, 65% of them endemic, in other words, they occur there and nowhere else. Over 400 vegetation types. If Kathy, if Kathy is here with a vegetation type book, she can hold it up. It weighs about 7 kilograms 
uh, it means a tremendous thick work uh, with uh, several biodiversity hotspots. Hotspot is a, an area that has high floristic diversity, but on top of that is severely impacted on by various measures that would affect its conservation. Um, and, and then several centers of endemism, very high levels of, of species restrictedness. So just a few examples to give you an idea, uh, just north of Graaf Renet in the Karoo, uh, these the plains that you know, from, from a distance look fairly uh, uniform and, and uh, grassy plains. Uh, of course, the moment that you get closer and you start looking at, at the flora that's available uh, in, in, in these areas, very, very rich. Vast, vast regions uh, as, as far as the eye can see. Uh, some of these caroid areas historically were actually grass-covered plains. And to this day, after good rainfalls, much of it is transformed. And, and it looks like just a, a normal grassland. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the grasslands, which in, in at least South Africa are in very, very old grasslands. Much older than the prairies, for example, that, that one would find in, in, in this continent. The Knausflakte, um, uh, the pebble deserts. Of, of the western side, where 1,800 species of mesums diversify. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. 1,800 virtually restricted to that winter rainfall area on the Atlantic coastline. Uh, part of that is this Namaqual and floral, floral display. Uh, after good winter rainfalls, one would come across uh, this enormous uh, explosion of Asteraceae, predominantly Asteraceae, daisies, uh, that, that burst into flower. Uh, again, many of them endemic, restricted to, to, to that, that area. The Richtersfeld, which is a rock desert, uh, this is towards the Namibian uh, border, the northwestern part of South Africa, where one comes across Aleodendron, for example. And, and the, deliberately, you know, I mentioned, you know, the title is the, the, the Aloes of South Africa, of course, today we know that Linnaeus, in 1753, when he regarded aloe as one genus, he was actually right, but for the wrong reasons, of course. So uh, when I say the aloes of South Africa, in fact, it's the aloes, the gasterias, uh, aloidendrons, the, the, the tree aloes, the creeping aloes, the, the uh, astrolobas, pulnitsias, and we'll you know, try and cover some of them at least during, during this presentation. Uh, this reclassification was proposed about, what is it, four years ago. Uh, four years ago, and uh, the, when we proposed this, this, this reshuffling, uh, we were told that no one will ever accept it. Well, everyone is accepting it, I think, at, at this stage. Uh, it, it, it gives a more natural uh, configuration of relationships in, in, in the family. The family is the Asphodel Lacey, which uh, for a few years was known as the Xanther Lacey, which is an Australian group, uh, but the, the, the family name Asphodel Lacey uh, uh, is being conserved against the Xanther Lacey. Uh, but getting back to the vegetation, this is in Cape Town, that's Lion's Head, this outcrop, uh, in, in, if, if you, you can drive up to about the Middle Ground Park there, got a wonderful view over the Cape Town Harbour and, and much of the, the, the western part of the Cape, uh, which, where incidentally Allopharox has become naturalized. It doesn't grow there, it doesn't occur there. The closest it comes to the Cape is near Riversdal. But uh, uh, someone somehow planted seeds there, and Allopharox now grows in Cape Town, where it doesn't belong. Uh, and then, of course, the savannas of, of the northern parts. This is Africa. This is really what Africa looks like. Um, And if you look carefully, there's a baobab tree. Um, Chuck, Chuck showed us a picture of a magnificent one. We'll, we'll see some of it at, at, at another time. Um, and this is towards the Zimbabwean border, the northern part of the Limpopo province. Um, Mupani felt, it's, it's called. This is a Mupani tree right here in front. Um, and and the, when we go back to the Angolan side, uh, this is Alo Mendezi. It's a cliff dweller. It, it grows vertically down, literally. And, and one doesn't quite get the impression here 
uh, there is a plan there, there is one there. Uh, and this literally is it's a vertical cliff face. So to give you a better idea, this is the natural habitat of Alo uh, Grows right there. This is near Tundavala in, in southern, southern Angola. Uh, uh, sticking to just the broadly, the, just to give an idea, these thickets in the Eastern Cape, this is uh, uh, Euphorbia uh, Ladiniae, Ladiniae uh, and that's Alopharox. Brian Campbell, Brian, we were there 2007. Uh, it's just north of Motherwell in the Eastern Cape. And if you look carefully, you will see that that Alopharox there was tapped. See that the leaves were harvested, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. This is the natural habitat, a very restricted area of Alobawia, which is uh, the most threatened aloe of, of all the aloes in the country. Very small, tiny little thing, very insignificant, nothing beautiful about it. Uh, and the, unfortunately, the habitat is being destroyed uh, at this stage, mostly through uh, urban, urban sprawl, urban spread. Um, Alopherox, you know, it's, it's the iconic one, and we'll, we'll get back to this iconic growth form from a horticultural point of view a little bit later on. And then uh, what used to be uh, Alopilansia, Alodendron pilansia, you know, the sort of the extremes, you get enormous divergence of, of growth forms from the single stem trees uh, to the single stem rosette plants, the miniatures, so tremendous variation in terms of growth form. Allo, uh, the Alopharox remains the most important medicinal plant uh, in, in South Africa. It's, it's used for many ailments. Uh, I, I always tease, I know it's getting old, you know, it also helps to prevent hair loss, which is, is absolute nonsense. You know, it doesn't work for, for hair loss. Uh, but you still get it in shampoos and, and skin care products. It has exudate. The stuff you can tap that runs out of the leaves, but it also has the gel. Both. Both components are in fact used. The one for, for, for uh, any, any uh, problems with the, with the gut, with the stomach problems, and the other component of the leaves for skin care. So uh, a, a very useful plant. It's very interesting that, you know, Alopherox is, is highly uh, consistent. In, in its expression, in its morphology. Uh, now, which is the most important agave from a commercial point of view? And Tequilana, Angustifolia, Sisalana, Forcroides, um, uh, Panamana, those, that's all one complex. Probably with the same ancestor, quite recent, carried all over the world. Well, the New World, parts of the New World. But in South Africa, it's Alopherox. And the closest to variation that one will find is, in fact, Alocandalabra. And that's right up in KwaZulu-Natal, right on the edge. And I believe both are, are good species. So to this day, it's being tapped and it's being you know, used for different products. Uh, this is a very spiny form from around Mossel Bay. Still very much ferox. And it's being tapped. This is right on the outskirts of the Red House in the Eastern Cape. Uh, so there's urban sprawl, urban areas. There you will see, in fact, agave angustifolia naturalized. It's a terrible weed in the country. Uh, and here yeah, in the foreground, you can see how the leaves have been tapped. These, in fact, have been abused. Uh, one shouldn't leave that few leaves. It, it's not sustainable. Uh, and eventually you will end up with uh, these stacks that then get discarded. A little bit of uh, canvas or plastic tarpaulin put in that, that hole and the leaves bleed. Um, and you know, th this is right there in, in, in that vicinity, there's uh, Crashula cotyledonis with those little head-shaped inflorescences, mesums all around um, and that's Carissa bispinosa in the Possinaceae at the back. Uh, and, and this practice is still used. Uh, primitive in many respects, but very effective. Uh, it's uh, Alopherox also has a, it, it has a myth attached to it. If you look in the background, those are cypress. Where do we plant cypress trees in South Africa? Cemeteries. So you know, one will often find, especially in the Karoo, 
the cemetery has a whole lot of aloferox planted, and it's a, it's a sign of life. Uh, the, the, an, another species, Gonia aloe variegata, which you will know as canidoid. Aloe variegata is plant, planted on graves. And canidoid means uh, difficult to die. So yeah, there's a little bit of culture involved. And, and this is aloeferox uh, planted in, in a cemetery with the cypress trees at the back. Uh, in the grasslands, I, I spoke earlier a little bit about the grasslands. The, the, the grasslands in South Africa are immensely old in, in terms of evolutionary time. Uh, so one finds that in a, there, there's an enormous amount of below-ground biomass in the, in the grasslands in South Africa. Bulbs, uh, geophytic plants, geophytic trees, trees that grow underground. And in the younger grasslands, the steppe, the prairies, that's not the case. Most of the, uh, the, the biomass is in fact above ground, but, but not in, in the case of South Africa. This is a little grassland patch in southern uh, Zimbabwe, that's uh, Alotauri. Uh, which sometimes is placed with, with sesame flora. I, I have to deviate a little bit from the species here, if, if you will allow me, just to talk a little bit about the hybrids. I mean, it, it, it was common knowledge, of course, that when you get a hybrid, you get hybrid vigor. The flowers are more beautiful, they flower for longer, they flower ir irregularly. Um, and, and this is uh, a combination that gives enormous variation. The same parents but you will find 20, 30, 40, 50 different forms being expressed the moment that you get uh, the hybrid. So this is, the, uh, th this is typical Africana. This is a hybrid of which Africana is one parent. There's no white ferox closely in that vicinity. The white feroxes grow on the KwaZulu-Natal bore. Uh, yet the, the, the white gene the expression of the whiteness came through in this hybrid. So the, the, that uh, gene became dominant. V very interesting. Um, another example is Sestriata with uh, Africana. Uh, and one can immediately recognize that pink leaf margin, which is typical of, of Allostriata. Uh, closer up with the flowers and if one looks carefully, the mouths are beginning to turn up, and that's a typical Africana character. Uh, and, and then these, uh, the, the, uh, in, in the 1950s, this, uh, this man called Atkulama, who started with, with uh, trying to improve on, on aloes for the horticultural trade. Uh, so he came up with a whole variety of, of, of different, uh, different hybrids, which he started naming. And this one, in fact, this, the, these last three slides, comes from a plant that was named for him, uh, Kulaman's Red. Uh, and, and of course, Ad Kulaman never received any recognition for the work he did. Remember in the 1970s, when the works of people like Reynolds became very popular, everyone wanted aloes, everyone collected aloes. But when you start collecting aloes and you bring them into a concentrated area, a small area, what happens? You bring in the pests. And in South Africa, of course, with them being indigenous there, there are a tremendous range of pests. There are, for example, a dozen snout beetles. Have you seen the snout beetle of the Agave plant? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a dozen that feeds on aloes. And they decimated the collections, literally wiped them out within about a 10, 15 year period. So all of a sudden it became important to try and develop a, a, a cultivars that, that are pest resistant. Apart from the fact that you wanted more, better, more beautiful, longer periods, different periods of the year. And believe it or not, Atkulama never in his life got a single bit of recognition. And when we, uh, some years ago, Estrella Figueiredo, you see in the audience, uh, and I did a book on the garden aloes, we tried to get a picture of Um At. We could find two pictures. The one we put in the book and the other one is this one, which wasn't a very good picture. There were no colored pictures left of him. He, he never had children. So I guess the basic message is, take pictures of your friends, please. You know, because you, before you know it, you know, it's too late. So Um, um At Kulaman, was, he never got any recognition, which was actually quite sad. Uh, so, deliberately, I'm showing you a picture of a few aloe people. 
So yeah, this is so there's Neil Crouch, this is Estrella, uh, that's Renal Klopper, uh, this is Demiso from Ethiopia, and Alwyn Grace from, from Kew, she's an ex-South Africa. Uh, Alwyn did a PhD on aloes, Renal did her PhD on aloes, uh, Sepsebe didn't, he worked on Silastraci in Ethiopia. So uh, uh, this is what they look like, that was just uh, sort of light relief. So, uh, this is what one can expect in winter, you know, a nice stand of aloe arborescence, what one would expect indeed of, of it. Uh, and when, you, when you're in South Africa and you breed for the South African market, the market dictates that an aloe must look like an aloe. So, you know, what does an aloe look like? That's very simple. It looks like either aloe malothi, and there's a nice form of it, a bicolored form of, of aloe malothi, and that's what you would be able to market, rather than something strange. Uh, it's, it's a different, different world out there that, that would dictate the demand. Another favorite uh, is to have bicolored inflorescence, the white and the, the red in particular, uh, is, is a very popular combination. So these one would increasingly find in, in, in horticultural trade in, in South Africa. This Molansians is the biggest uh, commercial nursery in the southern hemisphere. It's uh, just outside Pretoria, is, is their the main area, but uh, in, in, the, in the south of the equator there's nothing bigger. They have enormous uh, uh, stretches of land where they, they grow their material and distribute throughout uh, Southern Africa, and in fact they, they export as well. Uh, and yeah, just examples of two, two cultivars, aloe ice cream and aloe porcupine, this is porcupine, uh, being sold in quite large numbers. And again, you, you will notice the, the bicolored inflorescence, it's very popular, market demand. Another example, aloe charles, uh, very mag magnificent, very big plant and it can carry you know, 40, 50 of these candles. The record is 357. 357, it's unbelievable to see a, a, a display like that. Crimson column, with intensely red uh, flowers, but throughout you will see this is what, what becomes popular. It's a big plant, looks like an aloe, and ideally with bicolored inflorescences. But enough of the, of the cultivars for the moment. Uh, if, if we go back uh, uh, perhaps to some of the recent discoveries, recent uh, species that uh, came to light, uh, Aloe Braun van Weyckie, this is one that we named for a friend and colleague, Braun van Weyckie. Uh, very similar growth form to what most people still know as Aloe Zebrina. We've split up Zebrina, went back to the Reynolds concept. Uh, and recognize Aloe Transvalensis as a separate entity, but in this instance with far more intense red flower color, shorter inflorescences, even though the, uh, the rosettes very similar. The, both of these are Brown von Veiki. Again, strangely enough, uh, highly endangered and, and probably one of the top five, and again because of informal urban sprawl in uh, its fairly restricted natural habitat in the northwest province of South Africa. Uh, typical, of course, of this maculate aloe group would be the, the fattened or bulbous base to the flowers. Uh, and this is what transvalensis looks like. The flower is more pink and uh, quite, quite a bit taller. So you know, it can be as tall as a, as a, um, a grown man. Uh, Aloe maculata is uh, probably one of the more common ones that uh, is also grown around the world. Used to be Aloe saponaria. Uh, I think it's fairly now well established that maculata is the correct name for this species. And uh, as with many uh, aloes, one would find these capsules ripening while one would still have buds. So there's quite rapid uh, development, seed development. Uh, and it grows in the same general area as uh, uh, that aloe brown von Veiki, as aloe grandidentata, with uh, the exception here that the flowers, they don't have that 
Balbir Swelly. They're far more uh, club shaped in the case of, of, of Ali Gran, Granidentata. Uh, same with the macrids for the moment. Uh, th this is a species that's also popular in, in, in hybridization because of the variation in flower color that, that one finds so often. So in the same population you would find yellow, orange, red, bicolored, yellow and orange, uh, and, and it's definitely the same species, there's no doubt. Uh, but side by side, cheek to cheek, one would find the, uh, the variation. Uh, what, one of these that got reinstated, Barbatonia, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting that when, when Reynolds did his work on, on aloes in the 1950s, uh, his concepts were very widely accepted. Uh, Reynolds was influenced by a German when he did his work, Elwin Berger. Berger worked at uh, La Mortola in Italy, near the border with France, at the Hanbury Garden. And Berger was a remarkable man. He never visited South Africa, for example. Uh, as far as we could tell, he visited the States, the US, and he did work on Kleinia, Agave, Aloe, uh, many of the Mesum groups. And in all of those, his classification, which dates back to the late 1880s, early 1900s, became the basis of virtually everyone who followed him. And they carried his concepts further. And to this day, the influence of Berger is felt. Quite, it's quite interesting how he had the insights that, uh, that influenced many generations beyond him. Uh, and this species was you know, eventually sunk, regarded as uh, uh, something that should be combined with Aloparri Bracteata, but we've, we've reinstated this, reverting therefore to concepts of Reynolds, but in essence of Berger, going back uh, 150 years almost. The spots on the leaves, uh, it, it's a, a neotenic character, often it's retained into adulthood, in many species it's not. Uh, this is one that also retains it, and it's, uh, there's a lot of debate about what is the benefit of having spots on the leaves. Uh, you know, one theory is it, it mimics insect damage. So, you know, the insect will see that and think, oh well, that one's already been attacked, so I'll skip it. I'll go to the next one. So, so that's one theory that's put forward, uh, and uh, this is in uh, the leaf litter of uh, Euclea, Euclea undulata. It's a little shrub, caroid shrub, and the leaves are undulate, wavy, uh, hiding these, uh, these little seedlings of aloe microstigma. Uh, this one, aloe litoralis, I, I don't think it's that clear. Uh, it starts its life usually quite spotted, but then into adulthood it in fact loses most of the spots. Uh, and quite characteristic of, of the species is that the inflorescence will eventually just drop to the side. Uh, so when, when you see a plant looking like this, you know, typical aloe, and the inflorescence, the dried one is leaning, that's litoralis, almost invariably. Uh, in, in that same area in, in, in where uh, Litoralis grows, southern, southern Angola, uh, going into Namibia, uh, Allopalmiformis. Uh, this is the species that when Reynolds uh, included it in his book on tropical aloes, he said he cannot understand why it was called Allopalmiformis because it doesn't look remotely like a palm. And in, in, in fact it does, you know, strange. It, it does look like a little palm tree, especially at the distance. Uh, again, uh, growing not too far from, from Tundavala. Talking about conservation, this is another one of the highly endangered species. Allogersnera is uh, definitely on the decline. Um, in, in this instance, uh, it would appear that overgrazing, uh, perhaps you know, bad uh, felt management, is contributing to the decline of, of this one. It's also beautiful and the flowers uh, remain quite close to the, to the peduncle, the, the, the central axis, wh which is strange because that's a way for the plant to advertise that an insect need no longer go and visit the flowers. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen that usually, these the dry flowers will turn upright, they go up, whereas in the case of Gerstnerai they don't, they, 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 they stick 
to the, to the peduncle. Uh, some other recent uh, uh, discoveries, uh, by far the, the biggest, most robust grass aloe, uh, it looks, when you see it, it looks like a hybrid between a Molothia and a Pariflora. Uh, it's a, a, quite a big plant, and, and here's perhaps a good example. Uh, again, with with the spots, but uh, unmistakable, still one of the one of the grass aloe species. Uh, we we know very little about the the biogeography, the patterns of distribution of grass aloes, mostly because they're so inconspicuous. Uh, so you usually only find them when they go into flower. In this case, aloe krausei. Uh, when they're not in flower, it's virtually impossible to find them. Uh, especially you know, once there's been a felt fire, for example, that moved through. There, there are still questions in the, the, the grass aloes. The two groups, the maculates and the grass aloes, those are the difficult ones. Difficult in, in inverted commas. You know, the, uh, not that easy to uh, always delimit species. And uh, on this particular clump, uh, which has some of the characteristics of pariflora, but other characters that don't remotely combine with it, uh, it's, it's difficult to tell. From aloe cooperi, which is highly variable grass aloe, uh, we've uh, managed to split off uh, Sharonii, which is this one here. Uh, there is the inflorescence, very difficult to find. Uh, perhaps a, a better view, uh, much shorter inflorescence, and then these conspicuous white teeth at the bottom of, of the leaves which is a character that one does not find in aloe cooperi. Uh, and it's one of only two grass aloes where there's an angle to the base of the leaves. Uh, fortunately, a lot of seed set on, on this last one, uh, aloe charonii, uh, but encroaching in the background, uh, in, in a way, in a way, a curse for the landscape. Uh, th that's a, a wattle plantation, Australian acacia, wattles, yeah, um, in, 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 in this grassland habitat. This is pristine, but of course the moment that you have these invasive wattles growing in plantations, they spread, they move. Uh, South Africa doesn't have a lot of indigenous forest. We, we don't have forests. Small patches, Southern Cape for example. A little bit up towards the, uh, the Mozambican side, the, the eastern side. Uh, if, if we didn't have plantations of pines, eucalypts and wattle, we would not have a single indigenous tree left in the country. It would all have been gone. So, you know, there is a place for these things. But unfortunately they do impact in, invariably. Uh, this is a new species, uh, this one. Uh, Anyway, so we are, uh, we'll describe that eventually. Uh, uh, going, uh, let's move away from aloe for the moment. Aloe ampelos, these are the, the uh, uh, scrambling aloes. Uh, this is uh, ciliaris. This is, uh, ciliaris is a complex uh, based on chromosome number. Ciliaris, ciliaris is uh, 42 chromosomes. It's in, in uh, 2N42. In other words, it's a hexaploid. This one is a tetraploid, this variety of the doctor. Uh, and uh, the, the other one is the typical diploid. And, and interestingly, it's the only time with this chromosomal instability where I've seen a double flower on an aloe. Double flowers are very common. It can be manipulated, can be induced in a whole range of different plant groups and families. But in, in aloe, the first time that I ever saw it, there's, it's the same in fluorescence, there's that double flower uh, that, that developed. So if one wants to experiment a bit uh, to try and uh, invoke the, the, the double flowers, this is the place to start given the chromosomal instability. Two succulents there. Uh, this was, it's immensely popular, this, this form of, of Aristalo Aristata. This was in, in Portugal. Um, and, and it's a highly variable species. It grows from KwaZulu Natal, the more subtropical parts of, of South Africa, right through east west bo uh, line into the arid Karoo. Same species, no difference. And some of the forms, 
are very easy to grow, and others you can hardly, hardly get to, to, to become established. And it's here growing with, yes, there you go, Portulaca oleracea, which grows throughout the world. Uh, we're not sure where it came from, but it's everywhere. You, you, you find it in, on every continent. And it's edible, of course. Uh, if we move away from the, the typical aloes, at long last, uh, in, in the, fam uh, the genus Astroloba, there's a bit of movement now. For 60 years, nothing happened. Isn't that fascinating? 60 years. Since 1965, there was only one new species described, uh, which was Astroloba corrugata, this one. And that was in the late 1990s. And at, at last, for, uh, there's an interesting history as to why that happened, uh, which I won't bore you with. Uh, we, we, we're getting to this uh, situation. This one has never been described before. It's, uh, the name Smatiana is used for it. Uh, you know the name? Uh, m m those of you who grow as to Lobos, it was the, the, the epithet comes from Jan Smits. Jan Smits was a South African who was the architect of the United Nations. He wrote the Manifest of the United Nations, as we know it today. Uh, he was in the war cabinet with Churchill, and you know, he's a, a fairly, fairly famous. The, the airport in South Africa was the Jan Smuts Airport. Uh, but it, it hasn't been described yet. And, and the Espiralis, that, that one is known and quite typical uh, with uh, the spiral, spiral arrangements of the leaves. Uh, to give you an idea, within Astroloba, when it gets to the flowers, uh, uh, two species has this uniqueness, the inflated tissue. Do you see those, the inflated tissue? It's like little bubbles on the side of the period. And in the case of the one species, Herii, it's smooth. And in the case of Spiralis, it's wrinkled. It's quite easy to distinguish the two species. So that makes one small little group, two out of the more or less dozen species, and the rest not remotely like this, not at all. And, and I'll show you some of that. So for Herii, one is beginning to, the, 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 the picture is beginning to emerge of its morphological variation. And I'm quickly going to jump to the next one and then come back to this. Uh, we call it there the new distribution map. This is uh, sort of quite, quite recent where all the field work up to now, believe it or not, it was known from there and from there. That spot there and that spot there. And it was regarded as highly threatened because there were only two populations now. And everyone was searching for it on the southern side of this mountain range. Why? Because this is the much more measy claim cover that part there, and that's the much more harsh Groetkarwe, the Great Karu, on the northern side. And field work has now shown that in fact it has a distribution on the northern side. So it's, it's not threatened at all. And then I'm just going to go back to some of these. So uh, for a species that was regarded as by far the most threatened Astroloba, finally the picture is emerging that it's one of the most common ones. Uh, and it, it, it has a bit of variation, the striations in the leaves, which is much less obvious on this one, which has a more shiny surface. That's a, a trichodiadema mesum sitting right there next to it. Uh, and this distribution I, I did show you. Uh, this one, strangely enough, for 60 years, Astroloba robusta was included with this one, Astroloba foliolosa. Now, uh, uh, this, uh, this is also a very interesting item. It was described in the late 1700s. And the description, remarkably, was so accurate that to this day, if you read that, you can still come up with that one. You will still recognize this entity. Uh, so at long last, we are now able to separate out Robusta and regard it as a, as, as a separate species. Uh, I think at this point I can bore you for another few hours, but I think I'm overstaying my welcome. So, uh, with, uh, I'm going to need guidance from, from uh, 
Woody to, to tell me whether I have another minute or another how, two minutes. How much more do you have to get to your point of completion? Uh, Where you would like to have completed that today? All right, I'll, I'll wrap up in two minutes. Well, no, uh, the reason I'm saying that is because we have to clear this room immediately, and I've been instructed to make sure when he's done we won't be able to have a question and answer. I don't want to cut any of the speakers short, especially Gideon, but do you normally have 10 minutes more or 5 minutes, or do you know? Uh, <laughs> An hour? <laughs> Should you just stay on and you can be no. speaker tonight? <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, as I said earlier, one of my big fears is that I bore you to death. So that's the one fear. The, the, the other fear is, you know, uh, I know we must wrap up. And, and, and I'll be around for, you know, the next few days. So please corner me and chat with me. Uh, about these things and other things that, and we'll have another opportunity uh, tomorrow to, to carry on. So, we're uh, going to have another fabulous talk, but since you're calling it, which thank you, um, I've been, you know, in a position sometimes of doing things we don't want to do or have to, but we have to, because this room has to be completely cleared and set up so everything falls into place for this evening. Um, you want us to fold our chairs up? No, no, no. They have a team that come do that. Um, let's give Gideon a big round. Thank you.